Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about Atonement Day. Yep, this holy day is fastly approaching, and as you know on our channel, we like to go in and tell you about these very important days. In this class, we're going to be telling you when it is, we're going to be telling you uh, what it is that we're supposed to be doing in order to celebrate this day correctly, and we're also going to be giving you some other very interesting information associated with this day. Um, we're going to touch on uh, the Jubilee year, and we're also going to touch on watch days and even give you a little bit of my testimony associated with Atonement Day, particularly how I used to do it incorrectly and what changed in my life when I started doing it correctly. This video is brought to you by the Celestial Clock Calendar, the official timepiece of the 144,000. Get your Celestial Clock Calendar at coachingafight.shop or follow the links in the description below. Now, to understand what it is that we are supposed to do, we come over to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 27. Now, let me read 26. It says, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, and the reason why I read this, guys, is because I, I feel the need to constantly remind people that these are the feast of the Lord. These are not the feast of Moses or the feast of the Jews. You know, Moses didn't come up with these feast days. These feasts were passed down from the Lord. We go back up here to the beginning of the uh, chapter and is talking about how these are, you know, the feast of the Lord there in verse two. The feast days were instituted even before Moses' time. It's important for people to understand that, yeah, these feast days are written on the holy tablets, meaning that they were instituted even before Adam came down here to the earth. These feast days were important to our father, even though they may not have been written down in paper until Moses' time. People were keeping these feast days even before Moses was thought about. I mean, you could go all the way back to uh, Melchizedek. Um, who is Shem and how he was bringing Abraham the uh, bread and the wine that was Passover and you know that was even when Abraham was a young man and then you see Abraham keeping feast days him and Isaac you even see Noah keeping feast days if you go back and look at the book of Jubilees you'll see that he was keeping the feast days and then when you come all the way down to the Messiah the Messiah kept all of the feast days too even the post exilic feast days uh, like uh, Purim and like um, Hanukkah he kept even those days and he taught his disciples to keep the feast days and so it should be easily to understand that these that these feast days are important. And like the Messiah said over there in uh, Matthew chapter five, I believe it was when he was talking about the law. He says that these rules will never go away. He said the earth will be destroyed first. The earth will go up in a ball of flames and those rules will still be the law. They'll still be the rules. They're written on the holy tablet and they will always you know, be a part of our existence. Even, you know, when we go on to the higher mansions, we will be keeping these feast days. And I bring out, you know, for as just another point, you know, you know, there's a lot of individuals who are waiting for what I'm gonna call the harpazo moment, which is, you know, different than what we talk about when it comes to the rapture. These are the people who um, I'm saying are waiting for the moment when they will um, fly away, so to speak. Um, well, if, if, if you understand your eschatology, even for those people who believe they're going to fly away, they understand that it is after they fly away that they will face the judgment, right? The judgment comes after the ahapazo. So you question yourself, what are you going to be judged on? What, what, you know, are you going to be judged on just, you know, whether you went to church every day or are you going to be judged on, you know, what, 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 what's the criteria by which you will be judged? And if you don't understand this, uh, let me be the first one to explain it to you that you will be judged on your obedience to the law. But in the meantime and in between time, let's come in here and let's understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing on the uh, uh, Day of Atonement. You see in verse 27, it says, also 
in the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire. Now, this is pretty much going to be the meat of this um, this uh, this the video here. So let's go ahead and let's break down some of this stuff. Now, we've already established when it is. You see right there, it's talking about the 10th day of the seventh month. So looking back over here at Leviticus 23, it says, on this day shall be a day of atonement. So we question, okay, what does it mean to have a day of atonement? What does atonement mean? All right, one definition of the word that we can get over here is at dictionary.com. And it's saying that atonement is satisfaction or reparation for a wrong or an injury or amends. And this is what atonement day is about. It's about making amends for the wrongs that we have done towards our father. The atonement day celebration or the atonement as it's fulfilled will be that time period when we are reconciled to our father, when our sins are all done away with and, you know, we don't have to worry about that which creates a barrier between our father. That's what it means to make an atonement. The thing about uh, atonement, they, it comes by way of death. Um, when you read over there in, I think it is uh, Leviticus chapter 16, it talks about these two sheep or these two goats. Uh, that's where we get the word scapegoat from because one goat they killed and sprinkled his blood everywhere while the other one they spat on and slapped and cursed and then turned it loose out into the woods and turned it over to Satan. Um, well, that brings me to another point that I want to make about this day, and that is the 10 days of awe. To understand the 10 days of awe, we have to um, reference a book called Gad the Seer. Now, you can see this book mentioned over in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 29. Um, but we're going to jump all the way down here uh, to chapter 14, the last chapter in the book. Now, I got this PDF from the web. You guys can look. I think it's nccg.org forward slash gad.pdf or something like that. If you can't find it, I'll help you find the copy if you want to read about it. But when we jump down to the last chapter, you see it's talking about uh, the Great Tribulation. And you see how it starts talking off about Rosh Hashanah. Um, well, when we go on down in this chapter, I've covered this in a lot of videos, and I don't want to waste too much of you guys' time talking about this. But when we come down here to um, uh, halfway through the chapter, it's talking about these books that are that are opened. Um, go in and check out that video we did called The Ten Days of Awe, where we broke a lot of this stuff down. I'm only going to briefly touch on it here. But you see where it says that there are three books that are actually being read. You have the first book that is read that contained the just deeds of the people, and these people were granted uh, eternal life. Then you jump down to the end of this paragraph, you see that there was a third book that is opened that contained the wicked deeds of the people. And it, you see right there in verse 12, it says, and the Lord said to Satan, these are your share. Take them and do what you want with them. And Satan took the wicked to the wasteland and destroyed them there. Well, this is at a this is at atonement day celebration. You read about this Atonement Day celebration over there in Leviticus in chapter 16. Um, you can start right there in about, about verse 8 where it says that there were two goats that they had that they was about to slaughter. And then right there in verse 10, let me read that. It says, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement with him and let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And you can read in other parts of the book where the scapegoat, they had a guy who took him out there in the woods, but it was Satan who came and grabbed this scapegoat and took him off and did what he wanted to do with them. Well, that is what you see over here in the book of Gad the Seer when he's telling telling them those that are in this book here to, you know, uh, take them off into the wilderness and, you know, for, let Satan take them into the wasteland and do what he want with them. But the reason why I bring this chapter up is because of this middle book, this second book there you see in verse 10, it says, and he read the second book and it contained the unintentional sins of the people. And the Lord said, put that book aside, but save it unto the third of the month pass by to see what they will do with it. This is the 10 days of awe. Remember, we started off on Rosh Hashanah up there. 
Um, that's the first day of the seventh month. And then you have these three books that are open and this middle book that is open. These are the people who are who are doing unintentional sins. What I believe it means by unintentional sins are us people. Many of you who are watching this video never knew about the day of atonement or never knew you were supposed to be keeping the day of atonement. And so you were, do you were breaking the law unintentionally. You wasn't aware that you was actually breaking the law, not knowing that you were supposed to be keeping this celebration, this feast day every year. And so you're given 10 days in order to reconcile. You maybe you're doing some other sin, other sins too, but you're given 10 days in order to reconcile, to, to, to come to grips, to, to, um, make reparations with our father from the day of Rosh Hashanah until the, uh, until the day of atonement. And those who don't make these reparations by the day of atonement, well, I believe it is these people that's going to go with Satan off into the wasteland there. All right. So you see, and so we can jump back over here to Leviticus chapter 23 and it's talking about how it is a holy convocation unto you, meaning this is an important time when, you know, our family, all, we try to get as many of our family members around, you know, during this time uh, as we can. We even, you know, sometimes think about inviting people where they never really ever show up. But, you know, it's a very important time. It's a very serious time that, you know, we have this event. And, you know, back when we were keeping pagan holidays, didn't everybody show up for Thanksgiving? given didn't everybody show up for christmas didn't we travel all over the world to to keep these these uh those uh unholy convocations well when it comes to these feast days we treat we should you know think about treating them in the same manner too where we'll go out of our way to make special efforts to try to do what we're supposed to be doing on these days that's what it's meant by a holy convocation now, notice this part down here where it says, and ye shall afflict your souls. OK, now let's jump over and let's see what it's talking about. It's afflicting our souls now for years. I give my, my testimony right here for years. I, I've been keeping these feast days or at least trying to keep these feast days all the way back to about the year 1998. When I first read the Old Testament of the Bible, I understood that, you know, these feast days are important even as to us now. And I started trying to keep them. But, you know, just like everybody else, I started listening to the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug, who told me that keeping the feast days involved fasting from food. And so that's what we did. You know, I can't I, I, on the feast day. I'll tell you what I would do. Right before the Day of Atonement, I would go to the steakhouse, especially when I was single and, you know, in college and stuff. And, and, and I didn't have a whole big family to feed or whatever. I would go down to the steakhouse and I would I would get, you know, a big meal big enough to hold me for 24 hours, you know. And I'd almost sit there and stuff myself because I would know that I wasn't going to be eating for 24 hours. And and then. I, I would do that. I would I would fast from food. I was even fast for water for 24 hours. And then even when, you know, I, you know, I was the times when I was with my family, we would do the same thing. My wife would cook a big meal and we would eat a, a lot of food the day before knowing that we weren't going to eat. And then uh, on as soon as the uh, day of atonement was over, we would run as fast as we could down into the fast food restaurant and we get us some fast food just to just to make up for the food that we had lost. But it wasn't until the year 2017 that I started to understand that that's not what he meant by fasting. Um, my wife, I can give her credit for this. You know, we were sitting there one day and she brought out this verse. And, you know, as we were studying it, it realized this is what he's this is actually what he's talking about fasting right there. You see right there in verse six where he says, is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of the wicked and to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke. So whereas before they was telling us that fast has something to do from abstaining from food we read in leviticus chapter i mean in isaiah chapter 58 that it really doesn't have much to do with abstaining from food afflicting our souls has everything to do with what we see there in verse 7 it says it is not to deal is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. 
This is what it means to afflict our soul, to put others before us instead of us going on in self-gratification, making sure that we are living in pleasurable times, making sure that we have everything that we need is to go out doing doing this time to afflict our souls means to go out and look for others. Make sure somebody else has food to uh, make sure that, you know, somebody else has clothes to to. Um, and I'm, I'm going to have to do another class on this because the book called The Shepherd of Hermits goes into detail on what it means to fast as well. And it has everything to do with looking out for others. It has not much to do with ourselves. So my point is, is that when it comes time for us to keep the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, we should be looking out for our brothers. And like I said, it was only in 2015, I mean, 2017, when it, it, the father brought this connection to me and I understood this. And it, that, it was that year, 2017, maybe 2018 was the first year when I actually did the fast according to to what we read over here in Isaiah 58. I did this stuff. Now, like I said, that, that was almost 20 years. That was almost 20 years of doing it wrong. Well, then and then all of a sudden I start doing it according to Isaiah 58. Now, for those 20 years, I can't think of one special thing that happened to me, one good thing that happened to me on or about uh, Atonement Day or even after Atonement Day. But the year that I did it According to Isaiah 58, you can look at verse 8 and 9 and you can see what happened to me. Verse 8 says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy heart and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Yep, this is what happens. This was the benefit of actually doing it correctly. And that's why I bring this stuff up, guys. Many of you guys would like to see your health spring forth speedily, wouldn't you? Or your righteousness shall go before for you wouldn't you like to see that or the glory of the lord shall be your reward you would like to have these things to happen to you wouldn't you well in order to get the things in verse eight you must do the things in verse nine and today you see right there um let's see what does it say the word afflict uh it says afflict somewhere um, right up there in verse three, is it even uses the word afflict our soul right there in verse three. So that lets us know that that's what is being talked about over there in Leviticus 23. But look at verse nine. It says, uh, thou shalt call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke and put him forth the finger and and speaking vanity. This is the blessings we receive. You see right there, it's telling us what to do. And then it goes on to tell us the good things that will happen to us for by and having done this stuff. It, it goes on. It goes on. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light arise as obscurity and the darkness be as the noonday. How, how big is this, guys? Think if all of these things were to start happening into your life all of a sudden. Well, I'm telling you, as part of my testimony that it was back in, I can't remember, it was 2017 or 2018. But when I did the Day of Atonement, according to what we see up there in verses 6 and 7, verses 8 and nine and 10 became a permanent part of my life, guys. It actually changed my entire life. So that's why I say, you know, read Isaiah 58 and get prepared to do this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Don't worry about abstaining from food. If you want to worry about food, take that food out there and give it to some hungry person, somebody that needs it so that you can start getting all of these many, many benefits and blessings that it's talking about over here in Isaiah chapter 58. All right. And then after the flick of the souls, it says an offering made by fire. Now we notice in, in all of these, uh, all, all of these feast days, even the Sabbath day, we're required to make an offering made by fire. But the problem is guys, is that, um, we have messed up the offerings so bad throughout history. It seems as though we aren't getting credit for these anymore. And it even are almost seem like we're told not to even keep these. Well, let me jump you over here to a couple of places to show you what it is that we should be doing um, when it comes to these offering made by fire. First of all, let me jump you over to Malachi and chapter three and verse three. Um, it's, it's talking about, well, let me just read it. It says, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, as that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So this is talking about the Levi, his original priest that was supposed to be carrying the loaf for him in the first place. Verse four says, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. Now you read this 
a uh, book over here, Ma uh, Malachi. This is the last book in the Old Testament. You see, it's talking about the covenant there over here in uh, uh, chapter four. It's talking about Elijah, how this Elijah spirit will come and help those who keep the covenant. That's the same thing you read about over there in Exodus chapter um, 23. It's talking about the covenant angel all through uh, Malachi, the same as in Exodus chapter 23. Well, you see, um, you even see right there in verse four, how we know that the covenant is actually, you know, those four chapters in Exodus, because it's talking about what, what he commanded them at Horeb. But we'll do that in another class. We've, we've done several times already, but um, you can check that out. But my point is, is that over here in um, chapter three and verse four, how he's saying that he's going to be the one who brings back these these offerings, these feast days. I don't believe we're here yet is my point. Now, if you are already making offerings, Offering. Some of us are already making offerings. Some of us will do a bread offering during this day. Um, some of us will even go a little bit farther than that and do uh, blood offerings. But if you are doing an offering, I am not the one to tell you to stop. Like I said, I believe they're coming back. And if you are already making offerings, all that means to me is that the Father is already moving in your life, maybe even ahead of the time that He's going to move in the rest of us. The rest of us are going to eventually catch up to where you're at. So don't stop doing anything because of what I'm saying here in this video. I'm talking about the people that that has never done an offering before or don't know what an offering is. Let me show you something that we can do. This is coming out of the book of Psalms chapter 141. This is uh, King David that's talking here in verse two. He says, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. So this guys, and we can read in other places how we could use uh, certain forms of prayer, uh, lifting up of our hands, even rejoicing as joy as replacements for these offering made by fire. Like I've said, don't get laid. Crazy. If you, you know, was already planning on doing an, uh, an offering made by fire out there on the altar or whatever, don't say, oh, coach in the fight says we ain't got to do that this year, honey. We, we, we can just lift up our hands. Uh -uh, that ain't what I'm saying. I'm talking to the ones who are looking for something to do to say that they have done an offering made by fire and giving you the example that David used over here in Psalms 141, how he was praying and saying that let his lifting up of his hands stand forth as the sacrifice. But my, my point is, guys, is that, you know, we should be praying. That's a, that, that is one thing we could do as far as offering made by fire until the Lord, you know, does better with us. And he, he like we've seen over in Malachi, he is going to do better with us one day. But in the meantime, let's pray for each other. You know, you got all of these people out here, you know, suffering from these pandemics. And it's people out here that are trying to come up with solutions for the pandemics. You got people that are, you know, fighting fires and are, you know, uh, their houses have been destroyed by way of fires. People have even lost their lives in some of these hurricanes and and we got a lot of stuff going on in the world guys and this is one thing that we should be doing we should make a, a, a point to do this on atonement day is to pray for others you know spend hours you know minutes you know maybe even hours thinking of people that we can pray for both people that are alive you know people in the hospitals pray for people in the cities pray for people in prisons but we can also pray for people who have deceased people that have passed on some of the people in the news and, and especially the people that are, you know, our family members that I've passed on recently, we should be praying for those people. And we'll put that up as an offering made by fire. You know, and we'll use David's example, you know, when we uh, go before our father and, and, you know, hopefully we'll get credit for it. But if we don't, we know, you know, the father understands our heart. And we we like we said, we saw over there in Malachi chapter three that he's going to be the one to bring it back anyway. So, you know, um, I don't want to mess anybody up on that. All right. So let's go on. Let's look at verse 28. It says, and ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. OK, so this is simply saying don't work. Now, this is the majority of the feast days that, that we sell that we celebrate. It's mainly about abstaining from work and not going down there to work. Now, the, the purpose of that, I believe, is so that we can have this spirit to spirit type communication um, with our father so we can spend time alone with him. You can't do that down there, you know, you know, with Mr. Charlie punching out widgets or whatever. You know, he wants us to be in a quiet place by ourselves so that we can have this spirit to spirit communication. Important stuff goes on in the spirit world on these days. And, you know, we need to be in a place to where we can actually receive these spiritual communications. And so if we can find ourselves out in a natural environment that would even be better, you know, away from all of the concrete and the buildings and somewhere around grass and trees is a better environment for 
us to actually have this spirit to spirit communication. Because you have to remember, guys, our father is already back. You know, sure, the rest of the world is going to have to, you know, go through a lot of uh, earthquakes and 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 meteor showers and, you know, market a beast and all kinds of stuff before they'll realize it. But you can already realize it now. You just have to know where he's at. He lives in your conscious, you know, that small, still voice, that quiet, still voice that you hear. If you can get to a quiet place, you can actually hear that voice. And that voice that you're hearing is our father talking to you, to us. He talks to us through intuition. He talks to us through dreams. And he talks to us through our conscious as well. So, you know, we could take advantage of that if we can learn to get get to this quiet place. And I believe that's why he's asking us to take off work to help us to get to this quiet place. Now, now go on to look how important this is. Verse 30 says, and whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, that soul will I destroy from among his people. I would highly advise you to learn to always take off work on uh, the day of atonement, even if you have to call in sick, even if you have to leave early you know on the, on these feast days or some days when you know back in the day when i was fasting or whatever and i couldn't take off work well you know it was during those times when i would be at work and i wouldn't work i ain't gonna, I ain't gonna lie i wouldn't do nothing you know what i'm saying i ain't i ain't uh -uh. If, if i had to go to the sick call or if i had to sit there and act like i was reading training manuals or whatever i was spending time with the lord because frankly to me and you can say what you want you know i, I really don't care um to me my relationship with the father is more important than my relationship with the boss any day and i'm going to be obedient and i believe that's what one thing that we should do is work to be obedient and actually do what it says because you see what it says there destroy from among your people that's that's not like dying to me guys anyway let's go on ye shall do no manner of work it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings now notice here saying no manner of work because when you get down to the day of tabernacles you see uh tabernacles is what the one he talks about next you see down there in verse 35 it says no servile work now that's a different kind of work that he's told not to do then but up here he's saying no manner of work and i believe that's the stress so it, it, it so you say well i'm not doing any servile work i'm just going to mow my grass or i'm not doing any servile work i'm just going to no he said no kind of work whatsoever do we do on atonement day now notice he says it's a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings now this is for those who say that the lord did away with the feast it is silly for them to think that our lord our father in heaven changes he don't never change he don't never change nothing he actually wrote stuff down in the scripture and then somehow these people expect that he actually changed it you see right here it says forever a statute for forever so you ask him how long does forever last when does forever stop forever don't never stop you know what i'm saying we aren't never supposed to stop doing this no guys we are in the church age right now i showed you that year 312 when constantine took over the church in day five or whatever um this is the church age that we're in one of the things that constantine did was he came in and got rid of the feast days he replaced um our feast days with pagan holidays or whatever that's why we don't do tabernacles anymore we, well most people don't you know i do um and a lot of us do instead of doing tabernacles they're doing christmas or whatever that's because we're in the church age that's because we're in the pagan church age is what i should say um and that's not a good thing you know but for the people who are uh, love the lord and obey his commandments they, they'll never stop doing atonement day and even if they did when they realize that we are in these 10 days of awe where they realize we're in this reconciliation period and they realize we're supposed to be doing these days of these these feast days they'll realize they'll start to actually you know start to keep them again all right, let's go on to verse 32. It says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath day. Now, this is one of the places that we find out, or we find out for sure, that our Lord wants us to celebrate our day from evening to evening that's how his days work you know there's a lot of confusion out there because man i don't know when man day start does it start at 12 o'clock midnight or does it start when the sun comes up or does it start when you wake up in the morning who knows when his day start but the father's day starts in the evening time right when the sun goes down and if you think about it that is the only time of the day when the majority of the people if not all of the people on the planet are awake and doing stuff is at sundown not everybody is awake at 12 midnight not everybody is awake when the sun come up i know i missed the sunrise this morning you know not every, but everybody unless they're sick or working the night shift everybody is awake at sundown you know 
That's just, I mean, we're sitting there waiting on dinner if we're doing nothing else. And so that's when our day, that's when our Father's Day start. And that's how we know, not only over there in Genesis um, chapter one, where we learn that the day starts in the evening time, but we learn right here and in other places that his day, his day starts with from evening to evening. And let's see what else is in here. It's, notice it says that it's a Sabbath day, a Sabbath of rest day. So, and then it goes on to say that we'll afflict our souls. So, when you put those two things together, guys, we, we aren't allowed to do any work. We're supposed to be looking out for others and it's supposed to be a Sabbath of rest. Guess what I'm going to be doing majority of this day? Unless some hungry person shows up and I need to go feed them or whatever, I'm going to spend a lot of the day on my cot praying for people. But the majority of the day, this is and making reconciliation with the father, thinking of my own sins, my own, you know, faults and stuff and praying for them, thinking of people I need to forgive and making sure I, you know, get in a forgiving heart with, with the people that I need to forgive. And I'm also going to be praying for the people that are in trouble, praying for my family members, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and doing the stuff that's over there in, um, Isaiah chapter 58, which is included, says, um, look out for your own flesh. So that'll be the day when I may call some of my children that are off in the cities that didn't make it down for this holy day or whatever. Let's see what else is in here. I think I skipped a verse somewhere. I believe I did. It says uh, back up there in 29 it says, and whatsoever soul it be that shall not afflict in that same day, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. I believe I skipped this verse. So let's let's talk about this one right here. Um, what it means uh, to be cut off from among your people. We first of all have to understand who our people are. You know, he's not necessarily talking about our family that we can see or our neighbors or our community. He's talking about our spiritual people, guys. Um, I know I'm not supposed to tell you guys everything. Some of the stuff you're supposed to figure out for yourself. But I go ahead and let you know he's talking about your guardian angels. He's talking about uh, the loved ones that are protecting you from the spirit world. He's talking about your spiritual brothers and sisters. He's talked about the spirit spiritual community. If you don't keep these feasts, you're going to be like those other guys out there that are completely isolated from no from the spiritual community. Um and so that's what it means to be cut off. And there's a lot of ways you can get cut off, like drinking blood is a way that you can get cut off. I think that's why, you know, there's a lot of that going on in the move in the music industry or whatever is because they want them people separated from their people so that they can keep them down there doing what they want them to do, you know, pumping out them songs or whatever. Well, we don't want to be in a position where we're cut off from our people like we said you know um at the beginning of this video we are going to be judged one day guys you know we need to be understanding what it is and how it is that we're going to be judged so we can be making sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing so i'm gonna go ahead and close this out if you got something out of this video go ahead and hit the like button if you didn't hit the dislike button but leave us a comment either way